On enchaîne avec le professeur Lansing, qui est professeur euh, émérite d'anthropologie à l'Université euh, d'Arizona, euh, qui appartient aussi au Centre de résilience de Stockholm et qui dirige l'Institut de la complexité à Singapour. Alors on va enchaîner avec quelque chose qui en fait est dans un prolongement assez direct, puisque enfin, sous, sous deux plans en tout cas, c'est la maîtrise euh, du système d'irrigation, donc les systèmes d'eau. Cette fois-ci, on va se transposer à Bali. Et le deuxième point, c'est la relation avec la cosmologie et les rites, les rituels, qui sont aussi une dimension importante du travail du professeur Lansing. Voilà. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone, to the organizers for this opportunity, and please excuse my poor French. Uh, and, and I want to begin by saying the fact that I'm, I'm going to tell you a story about Bali, and the fact that it's me telling that story exemplifies the problem that I think some of you who work with UNESCO have to deal with. Um, it really, should really be a Balinese. I became involved in this project uh, because I'm an anthropologist and I work in Indonesia. And a few years ago, the Indonesian government asked me to help with the creation of a world heritage in Bali because they had tried four times and not succeeded four times. In the fourth attempt, they flew an island with priests and orchestras and had a magnificent performance here in Paris at UNESCO, but still it didn't quite work. And so I learned this, and why doesn't it work? It's absolutely beautiful. It's like, it's like uh, Banawi, right? And very much needed perfection, protection. The record of UNESCO in Europe is spectacular, really. Tremendous success in protecting the heritage uh, here in Europe. But there's a problem in, uh, in Asia and the rest of the world. And uh, so I had to, in, in trying to create the documents and the nomination to create the world heritage, working with Balinese people, say, well, really, in the end, it's, it's a problem of translation. It's a problem because these institutions that were really designed for Europe don't quite match, really, with institutions of places like that. And uh, that needs to be solved. So I hope my presence here is very temporary. And the next time, you'll have a triumphant Balinese to explain the further successes of this beautiful heritage. So uh, my story is about Visibility, really. The, the talk you heard about, uh, about Bourgogne was absolutely beautiful. And uh, it's all about, if I may say, the sacredness of wine. I'm going to talk to you about the sacredness of water, of water in Bali. Uh, it resonates. It's a history. And in a way, it lives in the mind, really. I mean, the story, the, the, the importance of that patrimony, I would say, lives in the mind first. It also happens to be beautiful. So now I tell you a little bit about Bali. And I begin by saying, externally, it's beautiful, right? I mean, who, who could choose a more appropriate place for a cultural UNESCO heritage than Bali? But now look at this picture. So if a thousand years ago, this would have been uh, lowland tropical forests. Bali is a volcanic island, you know, just south of the equator. But over the course of more than a thousand years, Balinese have transformed that island with hand tools to create Landscapes like that. Balinese liken this to a jewel, to a diamond, OK? And uh, as an anthropologist, I marvel at the cooperation that is required to make it work. Because this, again, these are faceted landscapes. I probably you can see the jewel in this. Three villages have to cooperate. These terraces have existed for hundreds of years. We know that. And yet, if people stopped cooperating and getting the water, this is all managed, you know, this is water moving through a muddy landscape. If they stop cooperating anywhere in the landscape, it turns into muddy hillsides. So how is it possible? I mean, how is this possible? And the short answer, if you ask a Balinese, how is it possible, they'll refer to the jewel-like jewel quality of the landscape and then to the inner jewel, the the arrangement of one's inner world that allows the kind of cooperation and sensitivity that makes this possible. This is entirely a human creation, right? Completely evanescent human creation. It's a triumph of cooperation, and it's a triumph of ongoing cooperation, not just with one's kin, but with multiple villages that persists constantly, right? Otherwise, it would not exist. So how does it happen? And I'll tell you, a little bit, tell you a little bit about that. So uh, to begin with, OK, it's a volcanic island to understand how this works. And oops, the Balinese are fortunate 
that their volcano is rich in minerals that are useful for plants, like phosphate and potassium. So the monsoon rains fall on that landscape, and they pick up minute quantities of those minerals. In 896 AD, a Balinese king wrote an inscription uh, encouraging payments to irrigation tunnel builders. Irrigation tunnel builders. That is the outlet of an irrigation tunnel. The island by now, there are still irrigation tunnel builders in Bali. They build tunnels, some of them more than a kilometer long, through the volcanic rock, arriving in the right place. Uh, this system exists. It was invisible, actually, to the Asian Development Bank when they tried to develop Bali. But anyway, it's another story. Out comes the water. It's then divided through a system of uh, 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 canals like this, which is also a ritual system connected by water temples. And in the end, it arrives in the terraced landscape. There are still terraces and tunnels being built in Bali in the traditional way. And along the way, the water is carrying those nutrients. So here are the phosphate levels, which are adequate to support the Balinese rice. As in the Philippines, however, this rice was replaced by well-intentioned, well-educated, well-meaning consultants who were trying to increase rice production because it's possible to breed varieties of rice that grow very fast and produce more uh, grain right, per plant. But there's a problem with that. So Balinese used the water not only to fertilize the plants, but also to control the rice pests, the ravageurs du riz, something like that. Okay, so. Along with us, there are insects and rats and rodents that like to eat the rice. So how do you control them with water? You control them by synchronizing the harvest, synchronizing planting at the same time the harvest, and removing their habitat. So they've just done it here. Nothing left for the pests to eat. If everyone cooperates and plants at the same time and harvests at the same time, that's the result and the food is, the, the habitat is removed. Uh, now, if there's a video, which I hope can play, to talk about the same time. The Green Revolution had just begun. The Green Revolution means the introduction of Western farming techniques, basically. It's high yielding plants that are designed to grow quickly. This also happened in Manawi, as we just heard in the Philippines. Pesticides. So this came as a package to the Balinese farmers. The farmers were told, in the interests of national development, Take this new rice and plant just as fast as you can. If you can get three crops a year, great. Some of the old people said, well, the trouble with that is, according to our traditional system, we, we schedule, you know, we carefully time when the water goes into the fields and when it doesn't. And it has their reasons for that. After a couple of years of bumper harvest, those reasons started to become clear. Stephen Lansing's old friend, Wayan Pege, is a farmer in Sebatu. He remembers what it was like 20 years ago when the pests began to appear. The Green Revolution remedy for pests was pesticides. It's not just that the farmers were advised to use pesticides. They were forced to use pesticides. They would, they would be punished by the government if they didn't, because the government would say, if anybody doesn't use pesticides immediately, as soon as any sign of pests appear, then the pests will spread to other fields. So within a year or two, even the farmers you know, pumping these pesticides into their fields couldn't kill all the pests. The government then began to fly the island dropping pesticides from airplanes, and they succeeded in killing damn near everything. He says that everything is made by a creator, and so uh, by disturbing anything, by killing anything, you're, you're disturbing part of the creation, so you need to pay attention to the whole picture. Essentially, he's saying you have to pay attention to the whole picture. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That, Stephen told me, was the role of the water temple. Looking at the whole picture, applying wisdom accumulated over centuries. In the middle courtyard of the temple, 
the farmers gather every month. They make decisions in a democratic assembly on how they're going to plant. So, oops, there we go. So the World Heritage, oops, I can't go back. Well, I'll just tell you. So the World Heritage consists of these temples and the terraces, but also the subox. These are the groups of people who share the water from a common source. We have reference to them beginning in the 12th century. So the world heritage, to reflect this Balinese cultural landscapes, needs to connect those things, right? Temples and water and people's beliefs about the control of the landscape. So we've just seen how does it, and why is, what is the functional role that makes Balinese civilization possible? Um, we've just seen that planting at the same time uh, starves the pest. And the water temples provide a way in which they can balance the trade-off between sharing the water and controlling the pests. So uh, there's a picture here. Yeah. So here's a rice terrace, and here is a subak, OK? And here's a temple. And here's another village, if you like, another subak. So they're obtaining water from this river, but they share water from the same source. So they both belong to the water temple here, and they also coordinate with their upstream neighbors here so as to plant at a different time, because the moment when you flood the paddies, you need the most amount of water to create a pond. But then as time goes on, you can reduce it. So by this coordination, they can share the water, and they can also control the pests. So that's great. Uh, each subak manages its own terraces, but it also coordinates with the neighbors. And uh, there we are, A and B coordinate with C. The problem is that on a typical river, there may be 50 or 60 or 70 subaks. So how can they manage you know, the flow of water and pests in such a complicated landscape? It's more complicated than, than growing wine in that sense. Okay? So here is an anthropologist's model. You have two rivers. Each of those little squares is a community, a village irrigation system. And you can see there are a lot of them. They coordinate uh, irrigation systems from the upper part, from the mountains to the sea. How do they get it right? Well, here's how they get it right. Here is a, a simple simulation model in which we allow each subak to plant on a random schedule. Maybe they plant rice in January and August. Or another symbol, triangle, maybe plant rice in October and, I don't know, April or something. Everybody gets a planting schedule. and then. A year goes by, water flows, rice grows, pests move around, and then they, they get a harvest. At the end of the harvest, they then check with their neighbors and see, did any neighbor do better? I got three tons, maybe you got five, so I'll copy what you did. So they all do that, and then we run it for another year. And this is what happens. They aggregate into groups that are doing the same thing. You can see the little, you know, the triangles, they're all the same. That's a patch of villages that have decided to synchronize their irrigation. It's large enough to control the pests, but it doesn't take too much water, so there's water also for the guys downstream. So we just grew this in a computer, and that's reality. That's what it actually looks like in Bali. So it's not hard to see that there is a functional role of the water temples. You know, there they are, right? This creates a system. Actually, it creates not only individual patches, but also an entire, I've got time for this, uh, an entire system of coordination. From the Balinese perspective, it is symbolized by the flow of water from the crater lakes in the center of the island. So there's a goddess who lives in that crater lake. This is her temple as it existed until 1936. Uh, so the photographer is standing with his back to the lake. He's looking up at the active volcano, the caldera, and he's looking at the wall of lava that came down and then stopped within a meter of the gate to the temple, which even the Dutch controller at the time thought was rather miraculous. Anyway, so that temple was there until a subsequent eruption buried the village, buried the temple under lava. They had to move it up to the rim of the caldera. And uh, here it was last year. 220 villages bring offerings 
things that grew in their fields, they take the beautiful things that grew in the upstream end of their field, fashion them into offerings, and give thanks to the, the deities, the spiritual forces that made that work. So here they are. Temple priests collect water from shrines around the lake, each one regarded as the source of water from, for whoever, source of life, really, of fertility for whoever benefits from that water. So they come in vast numbers, and this is a, sort of the center of the world heritage. 220 villages. Here, the high priest is explaining Pula Kirti, the origins of goodness, which consists of everything that grew, all the good things that happened that year in that place, filling the Pula Kirti with those things which the gods made possible. Here, the temple scribe is writing an invitation to one of the hundreds of subaks that belong to this system. Traditional Balinese letters, four more minutes. Okay, I'll move, I'll move quickly. Here is a subak leader coming up to the temple and obtaining uh, a ticket, writing down the name of his subak, going then to the center of the temple to request holy water, water that came from the springs around the lake, brought down to him, and then carried by him carried by him to his field, where it's mixed with holy water from temples in the immediate vicinity. And then every person, everyone takes a few drops of holy water, connecting then the whole hydrological system, a few drops of water from all the temples involved in this productive system, and sprinkles it at the upstream edge of their fields. So this system is alive. Uh, explain it to an engineer and they think it's beautiful, but if you were to, if you didn't know what I just told you and you saw someone with a little vial of holy water and a flower, you would not see a productive system. You'd see a religious ritual and that's part of the story. It really is the story. Do we have time for this uh, short video? Quickly, it's pretty short. Okay, roll the picture. Five, oh, five minutes then, no problem. Uh, the government understood this, they allowed the water temples to regain control. But the green revolution still lingers. To this day, farmers add chemical fertilizer to this ancient self-sustaining system. For the last 30 years, the farmers have been borrowing money from the village cooperatives to buy fertilizer that they don't need, applying it to the fields, it washes out of the fields immediately, flows back into the rivers and down to the sea. This little stream is flowing right out of those rice paddies up there. And as it comes down, it's of course carrying all the mineral nutrients from the volcanic soil, plus all that fertilizer. I mean, all the fertilizer that wasn't needed by the farms and is just washing down. So by the time it gets here, the sea, it's like a thin nutrient soup. And so the effect is you grow simple organisms like algae, the algae that you see growing along the rocks there. And that's what we find offshore, just blanketing the coral reefs. And we only find it in places like this where you've got that kind of agricultural drainage. On the rest of the island, if there's no river carrying fertilizer, then the reefs are fine. But out there, the reefs are nearly dead. Stephen Lansing and his colleagues are gathering samples from Can you stop? Oh, thank you. Okay. The, the more problems created by guys like me, really, by well-meaning, well-intentioned foreign consultants who are providing advice on things like agriculture with unintended consequences. So once again, this is invisible. Here we have the tragedy of farmers paying for fertilizer that, because it hasn't been measured properly. It's excess. It flows down and actually kills the, kills the coral. In the, around the agricultural drainages. We, I'll tell anyone who cares more about that story, but hopefully none of that's getting under control. So here we have then the World Heritage in Bali. I'll just finish with this. Uh, it, uh, it consists of several regions. The governor of Bali said the whole island should be a World Heritage, and indeed it should, but it's too late for that. There are too many millions of tourists, too much globalization for it. So we have the, the great supreme water temple on the lake that you see up here. We have the oldest, still traditional archaeological remains, the origin of this system, traditional Balinese 
water temples and, uh, and kingdoms. And then over here, the largest sort of intact, the least uh, globalized region of water temples and, and subaks. The red are the subaks. These are more lakes and these are forests. For the Balinese, this is the Utama Mandala. It is a sacred landscape. And that is the core, really, of the world heritage. So we hope it can be preserved. And the way we hope that that can be done, the way the Ministry of Culture, the Indonesian government hopes that it can be done, is by planning visitor gateways, eco-museums, uh, working with the democratic assemblies of the Subox to give them the power they need to, to gain control right, of globalization happening so fast in their world. But they have an ancient democratic tradition. From their perspective, they're already managing this landscape. So really, what is required is, with the assistance of the government, to make it possible to adjust right, to a very rapidly changing, changing world. And uh, my final, my conclusion is, for this to work, the key challenge is to achieve visibility, to achieve, to make, I've told you a tiny fraction of what this system is about. The more that can be explained to visitors, to the world, the more they will be fascinated and involved and willing to respect this system. So that's why I'm here, I think. At the moment, I have this temporary role as a kind of a translator. Uh, helping to make, it's a moment in history, right, when the Balinese need to be able to help translate what their world to, uh, to the rest of us. So that's the job. And I think it's a, one, it's a challenge that would be replicated all over the world. In the cases when, when UNESCO is working outside of the Western world, I think you have analogous challenges. So that's my story. These are my many colleagues and uh, uh, fellow researchers. Thank you very much. Thank you.